uh, our webinar regarding national uh, policies and uh, state and local policies. We're going to get an update from uh, really two phenomenal speakers this morning. Um, uh, my name is Stuart Ellis. I'm the president and uh, CEO of Charter School Capital, and I'm excited to have with me today Todd Zebarth and John Cairns, uh, really two of the leading experts on charter school policy and law uh, across the country uh, and uh, key members of the movement. Um, welcome, gentlemen, Todd and John. Nice to be here. Thank you. Um, before we get going, um, I think it'd be great for everybody to hear um, uh, your current roles and your history in the movement, just so they have some perspective and can be introduced to you. And I think uh, you're likely better at doing that uh, than I would be. Todd, can you provide everybody a little background? Sure will. Uh, good, good afternoon, everybody, and uh, happy National Charter Schools Week. Um, I'm with the National Alliance for Public Charter Schools, and I lead our state work um, in which we work with partners in states to enact laws in the states that don't have them and uh, strengthen the laws in the states that do have them. And I've been working on state policy for charter schools in some form or another since uh, 1997. Great. Thank you. John? Thank you. I began I, thinking about charter schools in the in the mid-80s with the Citizens League of Minneapolis. I helped write the original concept paper with others, wrote the first legislation and passed it. We then had a grant to work in other states to prove charter schools were viable. And since the early 90s, my law practice has been essentially only with charter schools, on policy and facilities and many other matters. Uh, thank you. Um, and for those of you who are not familiar, Charter School Capital has been around now uh, for 10 years. Uh, we were founded in 2006. Uh, we've been funding charter schools since December of 2007. It's all we do. Um, in our history, we've invested over $1.5 billion now in charter schools across the country. Um, over 550 charter schools and more than 650,000 students supported in our history. Um, as with these gentlemen, uh, we're dedicated to charter schools and, and that's our program and that's it. Uh, and today, um, we're going to get into some of the content about the changes and dynamics of the current landscape uh, for uh, policy and law around the country. So. Um, with that, these are the things we're going to cover today. Um, as, as Todd and John alluded to, um, we're going to cover today state policy landscape, some of the issues arising in different states across the country that may have an impact or set trends for things uh, uh, in other places. The federal policy landscape uh, and issues associated with that, which given the changes in administration recently, I think people are very concerned about. Um, and then trends and impacts overall that these policy changes or dynamics may suggest for charter schools going forward. Uh, in terms of the material you see today and uh, the, the audio track for the webinar, um, all of that is available for download afterwards today at charterschoolcapital.org slash webinar. So you don't need to worry about screenshots or uh, snippets or recordings. It will all be available. You can. Um, forward the presentation and uh, even the recording information to uh, other colleagues to the extent you want uh, today. And, and I did want to let people know um, we're, we're actually quite excited about uh, the attendance today. There's obviously a lot of interest um, and uh, with well over 400 people today on the webinar, uh, it's, it's obviously an uh, intriguing uh, subject matter for everybody and uh, with that we'll drop into some of the material uh, and kick things off with the policy landscape so uh, gentlemen you want to you want to kick off and and talk about uh, what people are thinking about today and and uh, what we should be considering as charter school leaders across the country I think Todd should start why don't you go ahead Todd 
Sure. Yeah, I think, you know, top of mind, obviously, for a lot of folks is, you know, is the new administration uh, in Washington, D.C., and what impact they, that may have both at the federal level um, in terms of the budget for education and for the charter school program specifically, um, but then also how uh, the new administration's support of charters and choice more broadly will uh, impact the discussions at the state level around education reform broadly and uh, charter schools specifically. So, you know, I think they're, they're relatively new in office, obviously, and so we're in wait and see mode to a large degree. But I think, you know, things will begin to take shape over the course of this year and we'll get a better sense of exactly how they're going to approach these issues and how it might impact things in the states in the next legislative cycle. Great. John, anything to add before we lean into the state policies? Uh, only that I had a number of discussions in D.C. last week with people right in the middle of this policy making. <clears throat> and I'll, I don't disagree at all with Todd's overall description, but I'll add some more details when my turn comes. All right, great. And one of the things I would add to all of this uh, as you gentlemen uh, get into everything today is that uh, the, the, there are significant implications of a lot of the policy changes uh, and the dynamics in each state that affect uh, the funding available either from government agencies, which are generally either subsidies or direct grants and uh, you know increases in programmatic funding, or the underlying market and dynamics for which financing options in the market uh, can be considered since anybody investing in the charter school space or providing capital to charter schools is doing it against the backdrop of what are the laws, what are the constraints, uh, what does that suggest for stability and or the future strength of individual charter schools, a local charter school market, or um, uh, things at a state or a federal level. And so a lot of these things may, uh, although people tend to look at them for uh, options uh, and uh, as a uh, policy in a vacuum, it also affects all the funds flowing in from other sources uh, in other places. So with that, um, Todd, you want to kick things off and run through uh, what's going on on the state policy level? Sure, happy, happy to do so. Um, so I know folks um, are working hard uh, in their schools and, uh, you know, focused on serving their kids well. and um, we just thought it would be good to uh, kind of take a look beyond just the school level and um, talk a little bit about what's happening in other states just to give you a sense of uh, what's happening nationally and what might be happening in your state or coming to a state you know near you sometime soon. So I wanted to first begin by just talking about uh, the continued momentum we're seeing across the country to enact charter school laws. Um, Five states have come online since 2010. Uh, Maine passed their law in 2011. Uh, Washington passed their law via a ballot initiative, the only state to do so. Uh, in 2012, it was uh, ruled unconstitutional by the state Supreme Court in uh, September of 2015, um, but the uh, charter supporters came back there in the 2016 session and uh, had the law reenacted uh, in a bipartisan way in the legislature. and so. It is unfortunately being challenged again by our opponents um, in court there, um, but we're hopeful that this time around it will be held up as constitutional. Um, Mississippi uh, passed uh, a law and then significantly strengthened it on a couple of occasions in uh, 2013 and 15. Alabama came online in 2015, and then we were happy to see uh, Kentucky come online this year. I became the 44th state um, along with D.C. to have charter school. Uh, laws on the books, and hopefully we'll have schools open there soon. Todd, can you, uh, as you mentioned the dynamics and the battle going on in Washington, uh, as an example, uh, as you go through these um, the the dynamics in various states, can you mention briefly um, what kind of support the uh, alliance is providing to uh, the state and local uh, lobbying efforts? Um, Absolutely. I think it's a yeah. So we were very involved in uh, Maine, Mississippi, Alabama, and Kentucky, uh, helping to build coalitions of national, state, and local organizations 
to work to, for passage of the law, uh, hiring folks on the ground, and including lobbyists. Um, uh, and in Washington State, we weren't as, we didn't invest as much resources directly into the state, but we supported a coalition of organizations on the ground who were leading the effort, both with the ballot initiative and with the legislation. And we've also been providing support to uh, the folks fighting back on the, the lawsuit against charter schools. Um, and there's actually a lawsuit's been filed in Mississippi that we're helping uh, beat back, and um, we're expecting there to be a lawsuit in Kentucky as well that we will have to beat back. So we'll be supporting right. those efforts too. Common strategy, right? When uh, new law goes into yeah. effect, uh, that the opponents, uh, having failed at the legislative level, then uh, seek uh, some uh, protection or try to shut things down at court. All right. Um, yeah. Yeah. No law states. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, just in, in, so there are six states that currently don't have a law, um, and we're actually seeing uh, momentum in five of those six states. Um, there's been legislation uh, introduced in Nebraska and in Montana. Actually, legislation passed both chambers, but uh, died. Um, it needed to be concurred to in the House and died, um, so didn't didn't make it across the finish line. Uh, there's been activity in West Virginia over the last couple of years, as well as in South Dakota and and potential interest from um, Native Americans in both South Dakota, Dakota and North Dakota um, in, in passing charter school legislation. So we're providing uh, various levels of support to folks in these five states um, and uh, are hopeful that over the next few years we'll see charter school legislation get across the finish line. The only state I didn't include is Vermont um, where uh, they already have a uh, choice through a um, through a voucher program actually at the at the high school level and there just hasn't been a whole lot of interest in Vermont over the years in charter schools but in five of the six remaining states there's definitely interest and you know we're we're hopeful again that we'll see charter laws there um, over the next few years too much maple syrup in Vermont for people to be interested in charter schools All right. must be <laughs> okay uh, major overhaul. Right, so in addition to the, the momentum we see in the states without laws coming online, we also see momentum in states with uh, existing laws, but um, but they've, they've gone in and just made substantial improvements to them over the years. Uh, Indiana is a good example. We, we have a model charter school law that we use in our advocacy efforts, and uh, we also rank each state's law against that model law. In our first rankings report in 2010, Indiana was ranked 29, and over the last several years, they've um, strengthened the law in a variety of ways. And in our two most recent rankings reports this year and last year, Indiana is number one. Um, so they've really moved way up by increasing autonomy, strengthening accountability, increasing facilities funding, uh, taking care of some other funding issues. And that's just a trend we've seen in, in a variety of states. I just flagged five here, Indiana, Oklahoma, Hawaii, Idaho, and Nevada. And usually what we see is some combination of Oklahoma as an example. Um, they only allowed charters in Tulsa and Oklahoma City primarily for years. And in an effort to expand charter schools statewide um, in 2015, they also put in place some, some stronger accountability requirements. And so usually these states that overhaul their laws are addressing caps, maybe authorizing autonomy, accountability funding. They're really tackling a lot of the key issues that create a much better environment for school operators to create good schools and sustain them over time. Uh, one thing I'd note for uh, uh, our uh, audience today is uh, in the GoToWebinar app, um, you should be able to see uh, access to and options for uh, typing in questions uh, for the panelists today. And uh, to the extent you want to do that as we go through, hopefully we'll be covering uh, the issues being raised. Uh, but we did want to let you know that that is an option. We'll try to address it as we go through things, but there may be specific questions that you all have that we can address during the webinar if you uh, enter them in, or that uh, Todd and John and our team here can follow up with afterwards if we don't address it uh, actually specifically on the call. So um, sure, I'd like to make a couple of comments about Todd's remarks, if I could. 
Yeah, please. Um, in the in the charter lawyers group that now has a, about 450 lawyers on a list, sir, we two weeks ago in New Orleans we talked about a number of state issues. One thing is apparent, and that is that while Todd correctly identifies policy victories, what we're finding in many states is the opponents are now using litigation to attack us more than attempting to block policy. And that's uh, that's. Uh, we're alert on that with the Lawyers Council, and we see a lot more of that than we have. The second point I would make is in a couple of states, <clears throat> we're finding school district authorizers, and in some cases, even as the legislature, school districts' representatives, tinkering with the charter school laws um, in a way that we haven't seen before. In Minnesota, for example, there's some signs that while all schools, including charters, will get more money this year, there's been some allocation changes so that in certain categories, charter schools, school boards are pulling money away from the center city districts, for example, into the suburban and rural districts, which has the effect of slightly increasing the imbalance of funding. I have no idea if that phenomenon is anywhere else, but it's starting to show up in places where we do have a little bit of concern. We are also, I'd add to that, that we are also seeing in, uh, in, in local uh, opponents or authorizers where the authorizers are the school districts themselves um, uh, who may, you know, may be supportive of charter schools at times, but also can be uh, competitive with or opponents, um, adding things to charters themselves that create uh, additional local restrictions on the freedom of a charter to engage in its own activities or uh, work in ways to attract either funding or student populations or what have you. And those challenges, uh, while some are, as you mentioned, litigation, others are just the authorizers building in constraints to the uh, either charter application process, charter renewal process, or um, the, uh, the uh, scope of what a charter can do even when it's fully operational um, that uh, build in um, competitive constraints that make the charters uh, less capable of delivering some of the value they'd otherwise be delivering uh, under the law and as intended from a policy standpoint. So, uh, Todd, policy issues progress since 2010? Sure. So, in addition to kind of looking at it through, you know, the no law states coming online, the states overhauling their laws, this, this sort of provides a lens into the issues that we've seen a lot of movement on over the last several years. Um, 16 states have lifted their caps either partially or entirely, and we actually find that in most states now, uh, caps are not a constraint on growth in terms of numeric caps. Um, obviously, that's not true across the board. Still a challenge in a place like Massachusetts, in a place like Maine, uh, in a place like New York City. Um, so there are some selective states where, you know, the caps are still a problem, but Compared to where we were at uh, in 2010, um, you know, that's just not a constraint on growth anymore. Um, there are other things that are beyond caps, but, but not that issue. Um, secondly, we've seen a lot of activity around uh, clarifying the rules of the road for accountability for both schools and authorizers. Um, Ohio is a state that um, has, has made particular progress on that, as, as folks on the call might know. Um, Ohio is a state that's um, you know, obviously seen some, some successes in the charter movement, but has also been plagued by some real problems and some real challenges. And um, the state's taken a couple of different bites at the apple to try to improve things. Most recently, uh, in 2015, through, through House Bill 2, uh, they enacted a variety of changes to their law to increase transparency and strengthen, again, school accountability, but also accountability for the authorizing entities. Stuart kind of mentioned some shenanigans we see sometimes from authorizers who try to uh, micromanage schools, try to re-regulate them through the application and contracting processes. And, you know, we've seen an increasing number of states say, you know, we need to hold authorizers accountable for the work that they're doing um, in terms of authorizing schools as well as accountable for the performance of those schools. And so uh, we've been uh, we've been encouraged by the progress we've seen there. And then lastly, um, facilities. As uh, I'm sure everybody on the call knows, this is probably the you know biggest challenge we see in state after state after state. And when a lot of charter laws were passed initially, 
folks just did not, um, you know, give as much attention to the facilities issue as as needed to to happen. And thankfully, we've seen uh, you know increasing number of states do really a wide variety of things to try to provide better support here. Everything from providing charters access to empty public buildings to providing some dollars uh, through a per pupil allotment to charter schools for uh, for the facility costs to trying to enact policies that will lower the borrowing rates for schools. Um, so, um, and this is one where we just see state after state, this is the number one priority as they head into legislative sessions is to improve facility support for charters. So again, we're seeing some progress there, but this is one where we need to see a lot more progress. Challenges? Yeah, and so, you know, kind of talked about the positive, but, um, you know, we see a lot of pushback out there. Rhode Island is sort of the state where we've seen probably the most success in pushing back against charters in the legislature. Last year, uh, Rhode Island enacted a law um, that cut funding to charters um, as well as created an uncertain funding system for them in the future. Um, they also passed a separate bill that really politicized the authorizing process by uh, requiring you before you go to the state to get authorized to get sign off from all of the local school districts um, in which you'll be serving students for um, for schools that are going to uh, be new networks up there and so uh, have really created a number of challenges for charters on both the funding and authorizing fronts. Um, Illinois is another state that has been dealing with a lot of anti-charter legislation in the last several years. There's a bill right now that's passed the House that would eliminate a state authorizer that serves as an appellate body in that state. Um, as, as folks know, um, without a check on school district authorizing, either through an appeal or another authorizer, school districts tend to behave badly when it comes to uh, charter schools, so it's important to keep that in place in Illinois, but they're dealing with a, a variety of other pieces of anti-charter legislation, and they've been successful up until now in beating it all back, so we're hopeful we'll do that this year. Um, Connecticut, I think, is an important example to highlight because a couple of years ago the AFT um, put forward a piece of legislation which really provided kind of a menu for our opponents in terms of all the, the anti-charter pieces they want to see put in place. Um, thankfully, that bill was significantly amended and in, uh, in passed and actually made some improvements to the law, but the starting point was pretty damaging. Um, and then lastly, in California, there's um, the last several years have been legislation introduced that would uh, damage charters in, in a variety of ways. This year, there's um, two or three pieces of legislation that would significantly alter the policy environment uh, in ways that would not be helpful, including removing the, the appellate process for, for charter applicants. So as much good news as we're seeing out there across the country, there's also a fair amount of anti-charter stuff that's been introduced, not only in these states, but in, in a lot of other states. And while we've been largely successful in defeating it, um, it's always a concern to us, and you know, particularly concerned in a place like Rhode Island when that stuff actually passes. Todd, um, a couple of things uh, that have popped up here. In the Rhode Island example, um, as the laws, as the legislative uh, process has gone through and changed some of those things affecting new networks. Um, did those uh, politicized guidelines also uh, relate to charter renewals or uh, issues for existing programs? Like, do they have to go get uh, local uh, support also in order to get a renewal at the state level? That's a great question. My understanding is that though the kind of politicization, politicization of the authorizing process that I mentioned uh, only impacts new networks. Um, the, the original legislation would have impacted everything, every type of new school and renewal. But again, my understanding is that it's just new networks that want to open have to go through that process. But obviously, I'm sure anti-charter legislators will be pushing to expand that to include those other things in the future, and we'll have to and our partners there will have to fight fight back against that. And then uh, another question is, uh, any insight from either of you about the dynamics of uh, Michigan policy and underlying dynamics? There are a lot of issues going on, and, and including concerns about cuts to online charters, but generally just 
Uh, any update on, on some of the dynamics in the state of Michigan? Yeah, I actually live in Michigan um, and um, have a kind of a front row seat to what's, what's happening there. There was a pretty extensive debate over the last couple of years about Detroit and what would happen to Detroit, you know, public schools as well as the charter schools in Detroit and some legislation was passed last year that um, made some significant changes to the educational landscape in Detroit, um, mostly, you know, helpful on, on the charter side, we thought. Um, and then, yeah, this year, um, I think as part of the budget, the governor's proposed cutting funding for cyber charters or online charters. Uh, it's actually a, a recommendation we don't totally disagree with. We, we do think states need to really fundamentally rethink how they're funding online charters, perhaps even using a performance-based funding approach, just because of uh, the unique nature of those models. Um, but um, I think there's been a fair amount of pushback within the state to, to those proposed cuts, so we'll sort of see what happens to it at the end of the day. Great. John. Um, as we transition to the, the federal side of things, uh, anything else you want to add on the state-specific side? Uh, perhaps one little historic anecdote, which is as to Vermont, one of the reasons we probably won't see charters there is because they've had a public school law uh, factor, which I believe is in the state constitution, which was rewritten in the 1800s, late 1800s. It became a model for choice programs. When we first looked at it in Minnesota, that's one of the first places we looked. But <clears throat> the story you're saying it. that you're saying it already exists in a form, and as a result, uh, not as much pressure to have it fall under the charter moniker. Right. So as to the right. federal situation, as to the federal situation that. There are kind of two major takeaways in the comments I'd like to make and discuss. One is that there's the high public profile of choice and charters in the incoming administration has certainly encouraged people all over the country in both the charters and, and other choice options, which people talk about. So that publicity has helped. I think it's, it's gotten the attention of a lot of people. It, it's tended to harden some opposition, but in, in other places it's actually um, been pretty widely seen as an encouraging sign. Um, <clears throat> the second thing is that a lot of the discussion about numbers we've seen were mixed up between the fiscal 17 and fiscal 18 potential budgets. The fiscal 17 budget, which was now uh, passed by the House and seemingly is going to be passed by end of the day tomorrow so that we don't have a shutdown, uh, end of day Thursday, we don't have a shutdown. Um, doesn't change much of anything. Um, the facilities grant support is the same. It's about 16 million a year. Uh, the, the grant process is going on right now. The general funding for Title One, Title Two, II, Title One may get a little bit more money, but what's difficult to ascertain at this point is whether that's being offset by other cuts. So the attention really is now going to focus on the fiscal 18 budget, and that's where some of the debate is starting to emerge. Uh, we know, for example, that the proposal has been to cut the Department of Education federal funding by 14%. It's not clear how that will impact charters because we don't know where the cuts will land. And it shouldn't be overlooked that less than 10% of all K-12 funding in the country is federal. I've looked at budgets for charter schools all over the country, and typically one will see somewhere between 5% at the low end and maybe as high as 11 and a half or 12% at the high end of federal monies, and a lot of that depends on free and reduced lunch aspects of the school's enrollment. So I think that <clears throat> I think that we're seeing um, some potential impacts. For example, it's uh, pretty clear that the fiscal 18 proposal will eliminate Title II funding for teacher training. Some of that money may be shifted over to Title I or Title IV. Uh, some may be shifted to special ed. Uh, the consensus seems to be more money will flow to charters, and there's also a lot of discussion about, for the first time, the federal government taking a more direct interest in charter options uh, like vouchers. The voucher debate seems to be settling on tax credits rather than direct funding, which will make a difference in many states, um, and we'll have to see. There's a, there is a, a, some confusion about the extent to which 
increased funding by tax credits or otherwise for vouchers could impact the charter school world, but that's still very fuzzy at the moment. And in a conference I was at last Friday in Washington, there's no clear picture except that the debate's on, and and there's a lot of questions being asked about how the how the future 18 budget might look. Uh, by and large, though, I think most most expect no less total funding. It just may come in different ways. The other thing that seems to be pretty clear is that some of the federal funding may become more competitive. That is, that it's not going to be necessarily spread state by state based on enrollments or charter enrollments or public schools student enrollments. It may be more, some may be put into more competitive grants, <clears throat> which means that, that there is the potential of some uh, districts and charter schools getting more or less and perhaps some not getting any at all. That that remains to be seen again. There's a, there's a lot of doubt about whether the Congress is going to buy some of those ideas, but again, it's way too early in the game to predict with any certainty. Um, <clears throat> so I think that's that's the big picture. Um, on the on specifics, by and large, in my discussions with a couple of people at DOE last week, they really don't expect to see in the charter sector anything except some shift of monies to charter support, but away from exactly what is what remains to be seen. So all, by and large, people do expect the total U.S. Department of Education spending and funding to increase. Right now, it's approximately 70, uh, approximately 70 billion, all told, around the across the country, and that may go slightly down. And again, it depends on whether the decreases are in direct grants or uh, tax credits or however one might do it, but um, by and large, the, the staff, at least at DOE, don't think there's going to be changes of great magnitude in the fiscal 18 budget, and then, of course, right after that comes fiscal 19. So, again, it's, it's too speculative really to say much there. Um, so that's where we are on the fiscal 17 and 18 budgets. And on the policy side, uh, the Fed federal government's been pretty good in supporting facility development in certain ways. They're pulling back a bit on that. The the race to the top concepts aren't going to play out much anymore. There's some discussions about federal oversight on core the core learning programs. That's basically a state initiative, not a federal initiative. Again, not likely to see much there. Um, so I think by and large, it's the high, higher publicity and profile of charters will help not only in Washington, but could help in the states as well. And there's uh, an ongoing discussion on how any support for vouchers might impact the future of charters. At the moment, it doesn't appear to be huge, but it's simply worth pondering all the time. So that's pretty much a summary of where we are with the federal side. On the, what about uh, facilities financing and support for that uh, at the federal level? Right now, the the staff person who oversees that that I talked with last Thursday doesn't see any decrease in the facilities funding, but he does believe that the process of uh, paying that money out will be far more competitive and there'll be less interest than just simply funding a little bit everywhere uh, in favor of funding specific projects of some scale uh, in selected states and, and with some selected CMOs and EMOs that are part joint measures with state LEAs and departments who are seeking that funding. Todd, any thoughts as we run, run through this about either the uh, your perspective on the federal landscape? Well, I think um, you know the the president and the new administration has you know put out their ideas as, as John articulated and. Um, you know, I think the big question is going to be how many of those actually make it through Congress. Um, I think from the charter perspective, there are a couple of ways to look at it. One is if you are a new school or a school that wants to replicate or expand, you know, you'll be heartened to see that the charter schools program is, you know, proposed at least to get some significant increases. Um, that that money, you know, helps schools, brand new schools start. It helps existing ones replicate and expand. Um, it provides some money for a couple of these facilities programs, um, all of which is helpful. Um, 
if you're an existing school that's relying on you know after school money or teacher training money or some of the you know Title One IDEA, you know I think um, we'll have to just wait and see what happens. You know the president uh, proposed some cuts to some of those programs, some significant cuts, and um, and you know we're hopeful that we'll be able to get both an increase in the charter school program. Um, along the lines of what they've proposed, but at the same time be able to preserve some of these programs that are helping existing schools um, with with some of these uh, some of these matters like you know before after school and uh, teacher training. So you know there's a, there's a lot a lot of fight to happen between now and, and when it gets across the finish line. But um, but I just think you know if you're a new school or an existing one, you're probably looking at the budget a little differently. All right. Um, John, should we touch on uh, additional detail around facilities or roll to uh, federal budget mon funding impact details or anything you, you want me to hop to? Well, it's, it's pretty clear that the, that the um, grant support and the credit enhancement support is not going to go down from what it has been, and that's supported a lot of uh, great opportunities for schools and facilities. But it isn't really going to impact to the scale it might. Um, I think that the real future of facilities is the kind of work that we're doing, Stuart, of getting access to, to the private capital market. Uh, in the philanthropy roundtable discussions last Friday, it seemingly was the message from some of the larger foundations uh, that their interest in facility support was at least stable, if not waning a bit, and their interest in operational support and startup support was increasing. So there's, well, I think the feds will stay pretty much where they are. I think the private sector, uh, private foundations are going to be slightly less interested in expanding facility support. And in some cases, there's some signs that they may simply switch entirely to operational support. And, and we've seen against this backdrop, um, we've seen an increase in uh, various options for charters across the country, including uh, direct interest and, and the capital side for programs uh, through us, where there are more schools accessing charter school capitals programs and more funding sources interested in um, uh, supporting and investing in charter schools through uh, the programs that we have, particularly on the facilities front, where there's uh, pretty rapid expansion going on there in terms of options, at least uh, uh, through us. But I, I see significant expansion in the options available to charters all across the country, both um, on the lending side, the credit enhancement detailed on the state and federal side here um, for loans and bond programs, and uh, more importantly than ever, I think, is the private capital flowing into long-term lease programs where the schools can control their own um, uh, facilities uh, without necessarily having to have or having to have the capital support for or um, the risks associated with real estate investment. So that expansion of funding interests uh, and funds in general um, is increasing flexibility and options for schools. Still, way short what's needed, given that uh, there are, I think, Todd, by your recent estimates from the National Alliance, uh, uh, more than 1.2 million uh, students or kids or families on waiting lists for the 7,000 charter schools that exist already. That 1.2 million on the backdrop of uh, 3 million kids in schools is a uh, near. 40% level of additional kids asking to get in um, and suggests really strong demand for charter options uh, across the country. Um, one, other thing to pay attention to, Stuart, one other thing to pay attention to, Stuart, is in the tax plan, the, the one pager which came out last week, leaving more questions than answers for sure. But one thing that I've seen a couple of commentaries from the financial market analysts is concern over whether or not the double tax exemption for tax exempt bonds is going to be tinkered with at all. Uh, right now, there's no commentary out of Treasury or out of the OMB on that, but um, that's, a, that's a huge deduction that has a great positive impact on the access to markets 
at some points in time when when the schools that eventually might be eligible for bonding and it's going to be a reasonably small percentage of the market may be able to access it. Okay. Um, uh, anything, John, on the specific details on funding impacts that we haven't covered or um, should we roll to the uh, additional um, numbers and financial information that you have? I think not. I think we've covered the basics here so far. Okay. Todd, other things you want to add on, on the federal side? I don't think so. No. One thing, that, one thing that's come up, and uh, you mentioned earlier, uh, Todd, was some of the dynamics going on in California. And uh, we've had a number of questions here uh, about um, uh, any additional details or dynamics of, I think, the legislative process or uh, from either of you about the local uh, various litigations. There are things going on there with um, I think the Shasta ruling and uh, dynamics of some of the local authorizers and large school districts like San Diego um, regarding um, uh, educational facilities or resource centers or what have you around the state um, and other things you mentioned about the uh, appellate process for charters. Is there anything that you'd add in terms of uh, the detail there uh, about um, the battle going on and 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 what uh, the alliance or or other national supporters are doing and how how that may uh, likely come out in the, over the course of the next few months in California specifically, Stuart, or more broadly. Yeah. Nope. Okay. The, there, we we literally had uh, a handful of questions regarding California specifically. Yeah, I, I think. The, sort of the big picture goal here is to uh, centralize authorizing and locally elected school boards, give them the one and only uh, bite at the apple in terms of a decision about a charter application, um, and don't give charter applicants who are denied the chance to appeal up to the county or then the state after that. Um, and the thought by our opponents is that by doing that, you know, that's a way to really choke the growth of the movement because in at least a lot of districts, the teachers unions, you know, have a fair amount of influence over who gets elected to the local school boards. And so both the litigation um, that, that Stuart mentioned um, as well as the legislation I mentioned earlier, um, that's the goal of both of those things is to, um, is to centralize the, the authorizing and just a, a local board without any uh, recourse around it. Um, the, I'm not um, familiar with the, you know, a lot of the details of the Shasta ru the ruling, but I think, you know, big picture, it prohibits districts from authorizing schools uh, or these, you know, educational resource centers outside of their, their district boundaries or um, allowing schools that they authorize to have those satellite campuses uh, outside of the district boundaries. And so, I know the California Charter School Association and the Charter Schools Development Center have been, you know, thinking through what are the implications of the ruling and working with with schools on on transitions. Um, and um, and then yeah, the legislation, you know, the, the those two organizations and others are fighting against it in Sacramento um, as we speak to uh, prevent it from from being enacted. And again, it would basically eliminate any uh, appeals in California. I think that uh, one of the reasons I think the California situation uh, is most significant is with about 20% of the student population um, uh, for the country uh, in charter schools uh, sitting in California schools, certainly it's a battleground that um, uh, has the potential for significant impact uh, across the country, whatever uh, happens there and however it comes out. And and frankly, it has been uh, a platform some, for some of the most significant successes in the charter movement, given its very high growth um, over uh, the past decade uh, and, yes. and its inception. So, um, all right. Uh, well, let's uh, let's talk about some of the key takeaways from your perspective, 
um, on these. Uh, John, you want to uh, take it away, or whoever wants to roll first and, and provide sure. um, thoughts on things? Well, this my is thought Todd. Is I can, I can... Go ahead, Todd. Sorry. Yeah. Okay. Um, I'll get the ball rolling on these um, in terms of what's up on the slides here. Um, you know, I as you know, I outlined at the beginning, we, we're making progress at the state level. I think we're going to continue to make progress at the state level, given all of the hard work by the you know charter advocates across the country. I think we'll see more facility support. I think we'll continue to see clear accountability requirements, which we think is helpful for schools to you know know exactly what they're going to be held accountable for and not have those rules change arbitrarily by an authorizer. Um, also pushing for you know enhanced flexibility. Um, we'll, I think we're going to continue to see progress on that. Um, I think our opponents are getting more sophisticated in their anti-charter strategies and tactics. I think they're pushing more and more legislation that would re-regulate us through more uh, transparency. I think um, you know what transparency means to our opponents is to make us look exactly like local school districts. Um, and so I think they've gotten better in terms of the issues they focus on and the words they use. Um, you know, we find it's very hard to go in front of a legislative committee and argue against transparency. It's more about how you define it and making sure people understand um, there's a way to define it that's helpful and a way that's not. Um, so I think we're going to continue to see aggressive efforts there. Obviously, we've talked about the litigation. Um, we're going to, I think, continue to see more and more of that. Um, and then I think they've just gotten a lot tighter in their anti-charter messaging. Um, both in terms of what they say and then how quickly they spread it, particularly through as social media has grown over the last several years. Um, uh, they've been using it as a pretty effective tool uh, against us. Um, and then uh, the last thing I want to mention here is just, you know, I think what the impact of the new administration will be is, is unknown at this point. We're fortunate in that we've had long-standing support at the federal level, going back to President Clinton, to President Bush, to President Obama, and now to President Trump. So having support at, the, at that level is nothing new for us. Um, what is new, obviously, is the, um, the fact that the Secretary uh, of Education, Betsy DeVos, um, uh, you know, is uh, her primary issue is, is school choice, not just through charters, but through vouchers and other mechanisms. So what the impact of that's going to be is unknown. Um, we're hopeful we'll see more funding for the CSP. We'll have to wait and see. That's the Charter Schools Grant Program. Um, we're hopeful that uh, funding for the other programs that charters benefit from will uh, will continue to to grow. Um, and then, you know, I think John made made reference to this. Um, you know, we're really unsure whether there actually is going to be funding for other choice programs, whether through vouchers or tax credits. And if so. Um, you know, what the impact will be on charters. So we've been taking a wait-and-see approach and um, in kind of waiting for some details around what those new choice programs might be and then at that point figure out whether or not it will have any impact on us and, and figure out how to go forward from there. And I think I would add this, that two things. One is that I've talked to a number of uh, choice advocates, particularly public choice advocates who are typically you would describe as more in the center to the left of center political spectrum. We're starting to see a few urban legislators at the state level and a, perhaps a couple in Congress less clear. We're starting to catch on to the fact that that as school districts, and we see this in Minnesota where Minneapolis St. Paul are both uh, facing severe cuts, the charter sector is quite strong and the uh, flexibility we have um, to move our money around as necessary and to manage the money in the schools is very, very important. And I think that a lot of urban legislators are starting to understand that their that their parents and kids are moving to charters in a way that they need to be at least neutral about, if not even somewhat supportive. That's that's one phenomenon which we'd like to see much more of. Uh, somewhat offsetting that is the point I mentioned earlier where, the, where we see some signs of the school boards and superintendents associations who never have been very much enamored of charter schools but heretofore have been reasonably neutral are taking a little bit more aggressive attempt at differentiating funding. Uh, Minnesota is quite fortunate because our differentiation is maybe in the 90, mid-90s right now and the changes that appear to be with some support this session might add a, 
half the points of that differential in other states, that might turn out to be a, a big problem as the differentiations are much larger. The last point I'd make is that for all the uh, for all the higher profile and coordination and policy side, by and large, the uh, energy being spent by uh, our opponents seems to be flowing more into the court system. And each time we get um, a bad decision, like Washington, which is of course fixed by the legislature, and there's more optimism about sustaining that one than there was earlier. Um, one bad decision suddenly shows up in another state. Mississippi was kind of a, a takeoff from the Washington case. And so we're seeing more interest in it, and which tells us the network of people who are using the courts to fight charters seems to be more coordinated than it was five years ago. Uh, that remains to be seen, but uh, the, the good part of all, about all this is the Alliance through its Litigation Council and Association of Public Charter School Attorneys are really on top of this stuff, and we have a very effective beginnings of a national defense fund uh, started by the Walton Foundation that's getting a lot of support. So we're much better prepared to deal in the court systems than we were five years ago. As you look out ahead, uh, anything you'd note uh, here from either of you as you think about dynamics going forward? And one thing as, as, you, as you guys think about this and, and glance here um, at, at uh, today and in the future, um, I would note that one of the biggest sources of uh, uh, resistance, confidence, and uh, momentum in the country is the whole safety and numbers thing, and that is that the dynamics of what we're talking about uh, today and what we've seen from opponents of charter schools uh, are not new. The nuances to their tactics may change. Uh, that is moving from legislative, you know, or policy resistance uh, to more heavily uh, litigation-oriented uh, resistance. Um, that said, the practical realities remain, which is the opponents of charter schools have and were significantly stronger in terms of numbers, dollars, uh, interested parties, et cetera, and still charter law was created. Um, uh, the, the, uh, the numbers and money being spent by the opponents of charter schools has remained huge for 25 plus years, and yet uh, charter schools have grown um, in population in the last decade from uh, 1,200 schools a decade or so ago to um, uh, uh, the, the, I'm sorry, from uh, 3,000 schools a decade ago to the 7,000 we see today, and 1.2 million kids to 3 million we see today. Um, that 3 million of families and students who are demanding that public education be better and that they have options to choose from uh, uh, continues to be strong. And whether it's the renewal of a local charter or uh, the passing of uh, anti-charter legislation or uh, other uh, efforts going on being engaged in by, as we mentioned, whether it's the teachers unions or other opponents for whatever reason, um, that resistance and demand for better public education options and school choice um, through and the success of the charter school program has continued to pick up momentum. Uh, across the country with local pro and with local programs. A decade ago, half the states we have even had charter law. So despite all the resistance, um, John and Todd, your efforts, and uh, those of the, the people and charter leaders you represent has been very successful. And although uh, we are here talking about both uh, positive momentum and the resistance or changes in tactics, I think people should uh, take solace in knowing that the fact that programs are better, whether the headlines say it or not, the programs are better than the alternatives. Uh, and whether the headlines say it or not, uh, the costs are lower for taxpayers to deliver um, better value in terms of student education. 
that funda those fundamental truths are what's driving the movement and why it continues to be successful and why I expect it will continue to be successful. Um, but that doesn't mean we can kind of uh, 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 rest uh, as there will continue to be resistance. Uh, so on that last point, I would, yeah. I would offer this. I think it's critical that successes are highly publicized in all states where listeners are located. And that, in fact, that seems to be happening a little bit more. I see less major, quotes major studies condemning charter school performance than I saw five years ago. And I'm beginning to see a few more studies like uh, some of the work out of Stanford University and Arkansas, University of Arkansas among them, making the point that now the, that the, that the schools that continue to grow and, and thrive are actually doing quite a bit better academically than the schools with which they compete in the traditional public school system. And part of that has to do with the fact that I think in many states, there's more attention being paid to either transforming schools that are underperforming or putting them on a very short leash. And I know that in some states, that's actually leading to some controversies about even closures on a slightly quicker pace. But the bottom line is, as we've matured over the years, it's very clear that most schools, in fact, I think the vast majority of charter schools actually can demonstrate success in academic performance in comparison to their to the traditional public schools in their in their region. Todd, I, I as you as you guys uh, conclude or think about any final thoughts, um, I wanted to remind everybody that um, the the presentation and the uh, audio recording are available for download uh, after the session today. Again, at charterschoolcapital.org uh, slash webinar um, or webinars. And um, you can reach Todd and John uh, and me or our team here at Charter School Capital uh, at the email address is listed here. Um, I do want to say as, uh, as, as you think about uh, for the listeners today um, and, and those joining us, as you think about the, the people who have, have been on, um, uh, John Cairns, as he mentioned at the beginning, uh, was, uh, although although uh, I have referred to him as the father of, uh, he uh, now comfortably sits on his porch uh, and thinks of himself as the grandfather of the charter school movement, just as the person who uh, at least held the pen on some of the original charter law. Um, and Todd's activity in guiding uh, the National Alliance uh, in battles all across the country, uh, along with John's support uh, as the charter movement has expanded across the country uh, on the legal front and advisory front. I think these are two of the leading advocates for charter schools in the country, um, representing organizations and, and, and really a huge student population now. Um, and and I, I personally, and I think on behalf of all of us, um, owe the two of you a great deal of gratitude for what you've been doing to support the movement. Anything you thank guys want to add? Thank you. Thanks. Happy well, thank you. Part of the movement. Yeah. Thank you, Stuart. And um, it's, um, you know, I think the the trends you kind of outlined in terms of the continued momentum forward movement really speaks to both the power of the idea of charters in terms of empowering communities, empowering school leaders, empowering families, um, and it speaks to the phenomenal work being done by the folks on the call founding uh, charter schools and expanding them all across the country. Um, it's extraordinarily difficult and challenging, but also extraordinarily important work, and so we're uh, you know, humbled to be able to support it in the ways that we do at the National Alliance. Well, well thank you both for joining me today. It's uh, it's a privilege to be on with the two of you, um, and and I I t you can you can uh, feel uh, somewhat uh, pleased I think with the demand for today's uh, webinar on uh, the the policy uh, dynamics across the country. There's really um, very significant interest in uh, the audience today. Thank all of you for being on. Um, the, uh, the number of people on from the beginning to the end remained a constant. In fact, actually rose throughout. So um, at least people seem to have found things engaging today. Um, with that, uh, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll close things off today. Uh, 
the information to access us. If you have additional questions uh, or thoughts, um, please feel reach out to, free to reach out to any of the three of us or download the material and, and presentation. And uh, uh, happy National Charter Schools Week to everybody. Um, uh, get out there and celebrate. Talk to you all soon.